Hello everyone, Cine 104. This is class three for the full semester version of the class. And if you're in the Saturday class, this is Saturday class two, and this is the class we'd have in the morning before lunch. Okay, today we are going to get into stages of the genre film and look at some really cool stuff from Bride of Frankenstein and The Shining and Psycho and Young Frankenstein. Really cool stuff. All right, here we go. So horror has tropes, just like all of the various genres. There are different musical tropes and different uh, war movies and romantic comedies and sports movies and all that. And so tropes are these wonderful um, things that are kind of common to them. Once you see enough of them, you start seeing the same things in all of these movies. And over the years, they have become tropes and they are sort of common to different genres. So in horror, we will get castles. I think that's Dracula's castle. Fog, thunder, lightning, rain, storms, all that stuff. Okay, dramatic weather for dramatic movies. And mad scientists often playing God, right? Creating life in a lab, creating life and various kinds of monsters, whether it's a uh, Frankenstein monster. Remember, the, the Frankenstein is the doctor, and the monster is the monster. So uh, uh, the, the Frankenstein is not the, the creature that goes walking around uh, tall and green and all that. That is the monster, as he's called in the credits, sometimes the creature. Anyway, uh, sometimes, often, we get women in peril, and this is part of uh, older horror-type movies, not so much today. Uh, and before you start thinking that all old movies are, you know, pre-woke and uh, it's, uh, you know, women and all that you know, can't take care of themselves and everything, it's really uh, specific to the genre of horror. Women in film noir and women in screwball comedies are very capable and very smart and often they're smarter than the men and don't need any help whatsoever. Uh, but in horror movies, often uh, the trope is that women are in peril and often they're attacked in their bedroom where you're at your most vulnerable. So that is, uh, those are part of the tropes. And so we're going to look at three stages of the genre film. And the genre we're going to pick, the genre we're going to pick is horror. And so the first stage is classic or the classic stage. And our example is The Bride of Frankenstein. It's the sequel to Frankenstein. It came out in 1931. I think it's a better movie. Uh, it has a bigger budget. All of the same people, Boris Karloff as the monster, and uh, the same director, James Whale, fantastic director. Uh, bigger budget, bigger sets, all of that. Fantastic movie. And so it is the sequel to uh, the original Frankenstein movie. And the original Frankenstein movie was written by 18 or 19-year-old Mary Shelley. So that's pretty cool right there, written by a very young woman in 1818, which is a little over 200 years ago. And she was vacationing in Switzerland with her husband, the very famous poet, more famous than she was at the time, Percy Bysshe Shelley. And they had a friend, uh, George Gordon, Lord Byron, and they were sort of the, 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 the deviant rock stars of the era. If you pick uh, uh, David Bowie and Mick Jagger or whatever with the, with the best uh, parties and drugs and sex and all that kind of stuff. They were, they were kind of the, the rock stars of the era. And the Shelleys were vacationing in Switzerland with Byron. And they were sitting around telling ghost stories. And 
Mary told a version of this, and her famous husband and their famous friend, Lord Byron, the, the poet, said, that's pretty good, why don't you write that down? And uh, so eventually she did, and it was popular way back in the early 1800s, and it was performed as a play for a while. So when movies came into being, it was a real natural to turn into a film. And in the film, uh, we will see, if you look at the clips that I have links to, lots of nice clips. Uh, the creation scene is wonderful in the lab. And there's a great scene of the monster and a blind man. And, of course, that's a trope. You know, you know uh, uh, blind and children aren't naturally afraid of hideous creatures like the poor uh, like our poor creature here. Um, and so he doesn't know. He doesn't know to be afraid. He's blind. And later on, when we get to the third stage of the parody in Young Frankenstein, we'll see a take on that from Mel Brooks. So the same, I like to look at the same scene in both of those films. It's, it's very, very cool. Wonderful lab. This is a beautiful movie really best in black and white. I don't want to see this movie in color. It's so perfect, especially the creation scene. We're going to see that wonderful lighting that comes from underneath, uh, casting all the shadows sort of up people's faces, the nose shadow and all that, uh, all that stuff, brow and everything going up uh, the faces of the scientists in the wrong direction. Wonderful stuff. And... Um, uh, we will see uh, the uh, the hunchback Igor and uh, and uh, lots of wonderful stuff, right? The giant lab, the set must go up 50 or 60 feet. It's a beautiful set that they built for Bride of Frankenstein. And some of the stuff was uh, used in Young Frankenstein. Apparently they had some of the, uh, the, the lab stuff, equipment, generators and things like that in storage. And so when we see uh, clips of this film, it's kind of this uh, age where it's not exactly 1818 and it's not exactly 1935. Uh, we see torches and things for light, which it, it is before Edison's light bulb and all of that. But we're going to see all sorts of weird generators and things like that that would have been from 19. 35 and the doctors are wearing lab coats and ties and all that sort of thing. So it's uh, kind of 1800s and kind of 1900s and that's okay. That's just Hollywood time really. And uh, and that wonderful bride right there on the left played by Elsa Lancaster um, and, and that, uh, that great sort of almost like a lightning bolt uh, of, uh, of white hair going up the side of her head. Um, they had to put some wire uh, netting and stuff under her hair there to get her hair to go up uh, Marge Simpson style so high. It's really wonderful. So, uh, lots of wonderful tropes will be made or created for the first time in uh, Bride of Frankenstein and Frankenstein. And other of those great movies of the 1930s like Dracula and The Mummy and The Invisible Man and so on. So that's classic uh, horror, but I don't want you to think that classic means old, because uh, there are still classic movies today. There, you know, classic war movies like Saving Private Ryan. There are plenty of classic movies today. So classic doesn't necessarily mean old. It's just a, a, a style. All of the all of the parts are there, uh, and we still have classic romantic comedy, classic uh, uh, classic uh, uh, war movies, and things like that today. So don't think necessarily that classic automatically means old. And in fact, some uh, genres are being born. Uh, we don't really have much in the way of superhero movies, really until we get to the 1970s with Superman. So the whole idea of a, of a superhero movie isn't even around in the 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s. And there are some magical uh, uh, magical type movies like 
Groundhog Day and Big and things like that, and they don't really come around until uh, the 80s and 90s. So those are kind of another new genre, right? And, and they would still be classic. A movie like Groundhog Day or Big or something like that, uh, Splash, would be uh, very much uh, part of that sort of magical... There's another word for it, but magical's part of it. And it's kind of a new genre. They didn't really have too many of those before. So classic doesn't necessarily mean old, but uh, really fantastic stuff. And as a side point, the monster in Frankenstein, played by Boris Karloff, and Tarzan in the Tarzan movies, and they did some fantastic ones in uh, the 1930s. And on the right, that's Johnny Weissmeller as Tarzan. Uh, he's all, he's all uh, lean and shaved and everything. He was an Olympic swimmer. Uh, so uh, lots of scenes and so on in the water. But anyway, um, in the books that they were based on, the monster and Tarzan speak a lot and quite well. Uh, the monster in the books, or in the book, sorry, just the book, he hides out in a house, sort of like a shed, like a garage, but not really a garage, but he sort of hides out and he listens in on a family and uh, picks up language and he sneaks in and steals books and things like that and sort of learns to speak and he talks and talks and talks about the meaning of life and philosophy and all sorts of good stuff. And Tarzan is also known as Lord Greystoke, and he eventually, in the first book, goes back to his family manor in England and goes to college, Oxford or somewhere, and learns to speak quite well. So uh, it's kind of odd that in the books that these two characters in particular uh, are well-spoken, but in the movies, uh, really, we don't get much from the monster. Fire, bad things like that, friend, good, right? very limited uh, vocabulary in Bride of Frankenstein. And Tarzan, also, me, Tarzan, you, Jane, very, very limited um, speaking in, uh, in the films from the 1930s. But uh, they're beloved films and they're fantastic films. So anyway, as a side point. Now on to the second stage, and that is Revisionist. And especially in the 1970s, this is The Shining from 1980, but especially in the 1970s, a lot of directors are thinking to themselves, likely, that's a, those are great movies. That's a great war movie. That's a great horror movie. Those are great musicals. I can't touch that. I'm not going to make a musical or a horror movie as good as Singing in the Rain or Bride of Frankenstein. So I will revise it, and I will take a different look at it and look at it in a slightly different, maybe a skewed way, and not use all of those tropes. So, second stage, revisionist. We're going to get a lot of revisionist films as we go through the 1970s in particular. This is, oh, our example is going to be The Shining from uh, 1980 with uh, Stanley Kubrick. We're going to see a number of Stanley Kubrick movies this semester. We still have 2001, and Dr. Strangelove, and Full Metal Jacket to go. So we'll, we'll see a number of uh, Kubrick films. And he's going to shoot The Shining at a big hotel, not an old castle, but it is up in the mountains. And it's nice and bright and very well lit. And uh, there's a, a small child, six or seven or eight-year-old, child, and that is kind of different for horror movies. Normally, horror movies are going to do adults, or maybe teenagers, because uh, who cares about teenagers, right? So uh, if we have a Friday the 13th, or a Scream, or a uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, or something like that, it's going to be young people, but usually not little six-year-old kids. So that is kind of uh, a revisionist sort of a thing, that we don't see very many kids in, in uh, uh, Dracula, or Frankenstein, or The Mummy, or The Invisible Man, or any of those movies. So those are some of the ways we're going to revise it. Uh, our character here, the monster, uh, played by Jack Nicholson, is just an alcoholic. 
He's just an alcoholic. And I shouldn't say just, but he's an alcoholic. He's not a creation in a lab or anything like that. Uh, and this big hotel, the Overlook Hotel, is a nice big beautiful hotel, but apparently there are uh, spirits in the hotel. I can't remember if it's a, a, a plant a, a created on uh, an Indian burial ground or something like that, which itself would be a trope, by the way, building uh, building something over sacred ground, sacred burial ground. But he's going to be kind of possessed, and uh, Danny, his little boy, has uh, certain powers, which are played down quite a bit from the book. In the book, the powers are much more developed. Stephen King's book. Stephen King wasn't a big fan of this movie, but when people make lists of the very best film adaptations of Stephen King books, usually this is the one that's number one. So anyway, sorry, Stephen. Uh, so uh, a couple of nice scenes from uh, The Shining. And you can stop right now and go check out the links that I provided for you, or you can wait uh, until the lecture's done. But I've got lots of nice links for uh, all these films for you to check out. So um, this is also referenced in uh, the Steven Spielberg film Ready Player One. So if you've seen that movie, you might see some scenes in there uh, that... Uh, after watching the movie, then watching Ready Player One, you might recognize. So, Frankenstein or Doctor Creating Life movies as revisionist takes, uh, certainly Edward Scissorhands uh, by Tim Burton, and a wonderful film Ex Machina, Blade Runner from Ridley Scott, and even Blade Runner 2049. Um, that's uh, Rachel from the original Blade Runner from 1982, right there, Westworld, which has, um, I can't remember what they call them in Westworld, androids, robots, replicants, cyborgs. Uh, oh, they call them hosts in Westworld. I don't know that that's going to catch on the way replicant or android or cyborg does or robot, but anyway, they're, they're hosts in Westworld. And so that brings up these wonderful themes for us. Uh, do they have a soul? Can they be killed or murdered? Are they slaves? Uh, scientists playing God, uh, creating life in a lab. So instead of body parts like we might get in Frankenstein, we have, uh, you know, created in a, in a uh, technological type lab. Uh, but sometimes uh, with, uh, with the androids and uh, replicants and so on, they have what passes for skin and, uh, and tissue and all that sort of thing. Uh, but sci-fi in particular, they love this stuff, allegory, uh, and uh, revolt, right? Revolt of the robots, revolt of the, the androids or cyborgs and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, if you kill one, are you murdering or anything like that? So lots of philosophical stuff that can happen in these, in these revisionist creating life in a lab films. And, uh, and there's a lot of great ones, a lot of great ones, including Blade Runner, for sure. We are going to look at Blade Runner uh, when we get up into the 1980s. Then, our third stage is the parody. The third stage of horror. Well, any, right? The third stage of the genre film, whether it's horror, whether it's musical, or whether it's a uh, war movie, or sports movie, or whatever, would be, would be uh, parody. This is Young Frankenstein from 1974, it's directed by Mel Brooks. And Mel was really the master of the parody. He also did a fantastic parody of westerns called Blazing Saddles. He did High Anxiety, which is a wonderful take on Hitchcock movies. And High Anxiety, uh, taking off from Vertigo. Okay, when you're vertical, vertigo, you're scared of heights. So High Anxiety, Spaceballs, which is a parody of Star Wars movies, Robin Hood, Men in Tights are the best ones, especially Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles is fantastic, and Young Frankenstein. Those are really fantastic. And so uh, we will see a scene of creation in the lab uh, with Gene Wilder there and, and Terry Garr and Marty Feldman and Peter Boyle as the 
creature or the monster. And a wonderful scene with uh, Gene Hackman as uh, the, the uh, blind man. And that's fun to watch after you've watched the, uh, that same, that basically that same scene in Bride of Frankenstein with, uh, I don't know who the actor was playing the blind man. Anyway, uh, it will be much funnier after that. And then, uh, yeah, oh, I don't want to forget to tell you that there's also a nice Simpsons uh, parody of The Shining. So I've got that link for you there, too. So don't forget to watch the Simpsons parody of The Shining. So that is the three stages of the genre film. And now we're going to get back into uh, our chronological order here. We left off somewhere in the 1950s with, uh, with movies like uh, Rub Without a Cause and so on. So we're going, to go back to the, we're going to go back to the 50s, early 60s and visit the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. And Hitchcock personifies the auteur. That's a, a theory. I think we talked about that in class number one. And it's just the French word for author, but the, the part of this school of thought goes that some directors, not all, but some directors are the author of the film. In the, in the uh, studio, the height of the studio system days, it would have been the studio that was mainly responsible for the look of the film and who was in it and, and all of that and how it was put together. But there are a few directors in, in the 30s and 40s, there would be a few directors like Busby Berkeley or Preston Sturgis or John Ford or uh, Frank Capra. But really in the early part, the studio system days, it was really the producers and the studios that determined the look of a film. But now as we get into the 60s, with Alfred Hitchcock, and for sure, more recently, with Francis Coppola and Steven Spielberg and Quentin Tarantino and Wes Anderson and all of that. So Hitchcock, the master of suspense. Now he he didn't really do much horror. That's his most famous film, was Psycho, but he was mostly about suspense. Uh, so Psycho was a little bit of uh, of a, a, a different kind of a film for him. And The Birds is kind of horror too, but mostly he was doing suspenseful things, not really not really horrific uh, type movies. And he and Walt Disney were among the very few in Hollywood who really embraced early 1950s TV. And so I have a link for a nice clip from Hitchcock's television show called Alfred Hitchcock Presents. A lot of them are on YouTube, I see. And he hosted the show and directed a few of them. Not too many, but he, he was mostly doing features, but he directed a few of them. But he came into Americans' households once a week. Very funny, very droll, dry sense of humor. Uh, so I've linked to some of his introductions. They're really funny. And people just really loved Hitchcock and the way he would go about it. He was English, and he spoke in this wonderful uh, upper-class English-type accent, and so on. So um, you get a chance to see a little bit of, of Alfred Hitchcock in his TV persona, but he was very early in branding his own films, right? So The Master of Suspense, and, um, and it would be Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo and Rear Window, right? So he really got his name right up there. He was very smart in that way, a pretty good businessman. Um, and, uh, and he really had the Hitchcock brand. He, he actually had a magazine, Alfred Hitchcock, uh, a mystery magazine, and a few other things. So he was, he was pretty good at all that. So after we look at a little bit of Alfred Hitchcock uh, and his television show, then we want to jump to, uh, oh, and sorry, uh, Walt Disney with two television shows, Disneyland from 1954 and the Mickey Mouse Club from 1955. So uh, he and Hitchcock were, were early uh, in the television game. Most of Hollywood didn't really get into TV until 58, 59, something like that. But um, uh, Walt Disney 
wanted to build that theme park, the theme park, the famous theme park, Disneyland, and he was looking for funding. Uh, his brother, Roy, didn't want him to take it out of the movie business, so he was trying to find funding from somewhere else. And he went to the studios, and they really didn't care, because that would be competing with them, I guess in a way. And so he went to television networks, and the ABC television network, they were a brand new network. They were created out of the NBC Red or Blue. NBC had two uh, radio networks, NBC Red and NBC Blue. And I think it was created out of NBC Blue, and they split it off. The courts ruled NBC had a monopoly. They split it off. They turned it into the American Broadcasting Company, and they didn't have all the talent that NBC and CBS had. So they were kind of desperate. And when Disney asked them for funding for his theme park, they said, uh, we will if you make a television show for us. And so he made Disneyland, 1954, uh, and he could repurpose some of his uh, uh, movies like Fantasia and Mickey Mouse cartoons. And then he did some, he did some stuff. Some of it was quite popular, like the uh, like the episodes revolving around Davy Crockett and things like that. And then the next year, he and he was promoting his his new theme park as well. Some of them were set right at the theme park. So and it's called Disneyland. So he it's kind of funny, but he really was promoting uh, his theme park on the television show every week, sort of like an infomercial. And he also did the Mickey Mouse Club, 1955, for a few years. Uh, it was brought back, I think, in the 90s uh, with, uh, with Brittany and uh, Ryan and Christina and uh, people like that who uh, were uh, young teenagers. And they were in, I think it was called the new Mickey Mouse Club, somewhere in the 1990s or so, the middle or late 1990s. Um, and they went on to to be famous as well. Part of Hitchcock's uh, traits are cool blondes. Okay, and uh, there we have Grace Kelly. She was a former model and ended up becoming Princess Grace of Monaco. So Hitchcock was not very happy when she married a royal and moved away from the United States, moved out of the United States to Monaco, down there on the Mediterranean. But anyway, she was a cool blonde, not um, the, the curvy, sexy, dumb, blonde, Marilyn Monroe type, or Jane Mansfield type, or something like that. This was uh, designated as a different kind of blonde, but Hitchcock had a thing for blondes, and uh, he liked Grace Kelly, and there were a few uh, other uh, blondes that he used, Kim Novak and people like that. Uh, after uh, after Grace became Princess Grace. But anyway, cool blondes, part of it. And she always uh, wore, in, I think they only made two movies together, maybe three, uh, the very height of fashion. She was, she was uh, uh, designed or dressed by the top fashion designers uh, in the world or in Hollywood. Uh, so, so what she's wearing there would be really the height of 1950s fashion. Voyeurism is another part of Hitchcock's, uh, uh, Hitchcock's uh, uh, traits that we see. It's like a peeping in on people, looking spy, kind of a spying thing, peeping into windows and things like that. And we're going to see a lot of it in uh, this film here, Rear Window. Uh, he thinks that our protagonist here, played by Jimmy Stewart, thinks he sees uh, possibly a murder in uh, the apartment across the way from the courtyard. And he's got his binoculars, and later on he's got a very long telephoto lens on his camera. He's a professional photographer, so we're going to see some of that. That's voyeurism. We're going to see some voyeurism in Psycho as well. It's part of Hitchcock's thing. Uh, so, um, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, let's see. Cameos, another part of Hitchcock's traits. There he is in a non-speaking role. It would be very short, very quick, but it was kind of a good luck thing for Hitchcock to appear in his own movies. He usually did very early in the movie, so as not to distract the audience too much. He didn't want people looking for him. There were a few people that knew. You know, word had sort of gotten out, hey, there's Hitchcock, and word had gotten out, so he did it early in the movie so that uh, the audience wouldn't be distracted and miss the plot of the main film. 
Also, uh, there's a thing called the Hitchcock MacGuffin, and the MacGuffin is, it's, it kind of misleads the audience. And in Psycho, uh, in the opening credits, or the opening scenes, they're going to talk about the day and the date and the time and the location. Um, there's going to be some stolen money. Uh, there are, there are uh, letters and stolen things all through his movies, all through his movies. And they are just kind of a distraction. They're not really part of the main movie. Psycho is about murder. It's not about theft or anything like that. Um, so uh, every Hitchcock movie doesn't have a MacGuffin, but uh, a, a lot of them do. And some people look for MacGuffins in like Star Wars movies and things like that. Uh, sort of a, a meaningless uh, plot point uh, that is there to kind of distract the audience. I'm kind of a purist and I tend to think that only Hitchcock movies have MacGuffins. Uh, I'm probably in the minority on that. But uh, anyway, you'll, you'll come up with the term MacGuffin if you do some searching online and MacGuffins in other movies and things like that. And like I say, I, I don't think there's a MacGuffin in Rear Window, but Psycho has uh, definitely the stolen money as a MacGuffin. So he had a pretty darn good decade. Uh, and that shot is from the uh, opening when he hosted his television show and they played this wonderful piece of music. You'll hear it when you go to the link. Uh, and that piece of music is called The Funeral March of the Marionettes. I don't know who did it, but it's a wonderful piece of music that they used for his television show. And then whenever he appeared maybe on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson or something like that, they'd always play that music for him. And that sort of became Hitchcock's theme. Anyway, pretty darn good decade. That's not even all the movies he made uh, during that decade. I think it's missing one or two others, but Strangers on a Train, Rear Window, To Catch a Thief, Vertigo, really fantastic stuff, North by Northwest with Cary Grant, and Psycho from 1960, so just barely outside the 1950s. So uh, pretty good decade. Don't worry about the whole list of movies. I'm not going to ask you for lists of things of movies. I just want you to know that he had a pretty good decade, especially in the 50s. But he was making movies in the late 20s and all the way up to the 1970s. I don't know if he got into the 1980s or not. I can't remember. But he, he had a 50-year career uh, making movies. Much like Spielberg and Scorsese, actually, who began in the uh, in the 70s and are making movies still today. So uh, that's a 50-year career that Hitchcock has. Kind of rare, but we've got uh, those two uh, that are honing in on a 50-year uh, career. Fantastic for them. All right, so let's get into uh, Rear Window. 1954, we get the Warriors and we get the cool blonde. We get a non-heroic, obsessive protagonist, sort of the wrong man, and Hitchcock liked to have often, not always, often, regular, ordinary type people, not not uh, spies or cops or heroic people, but people that were are maybe, uh, maybe they are mistaken, the wrong man, mistaken identity. And then he's even got a movie called The Wrong Man, but uh, that was part of his thing. And here, this guy here played by Jimmy Stewart, he's just a photographer. He's just a photographer and he thinks he sees a murder in, and we can kind of see right here, these would be, uh, the windows of, across the courtyard. There are uh, other apartments and things. And the opening scene, I have a link to it. The opening scene is fantastic. And we see so much presented non-verbally. And Hitchcock was really good with the, the art of cinema, really, the art of cinema. Instead of, you know, what they tell you in the, in the cinema is, show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. And so instead of saying, it, how hot is it? Boy, it's really hot. Oh my gosh, how'd you break your leg? Right? Instead of just going through all that stuff, Hitchcock shows us. He shows us that it's hot. He pans across the courtyard. We see a thermometer. We see the beads of sweat on his brow. We see a cast on his leg. And we even to his name here, L.B. Jeffries and things like that. And then the camera pans across. You'll see it. There's a nice link to it. You'll see uh, that we see some cameras. There's a broken camera, and then we see a picture of a car careening toward the camera. So clearly, uh, he was too far into the race, right? Trying to shoot. He got 
hit by a car, his camera got all busted up, but he got a pretty good photo out of it. And then we see a, um, a negative of a, of a woman, and then the camera pans across and we see uh, that same photo as a positive on a magazine cover of a beautiful woman who happens to be Grace Kelly. So we've told a lot non-verbally, right? We've told a lot non-verbally that he, he is a, an adventurous camera man who shoots photos for magazines and things and has broken his leg and all of that. And we see the whole courtyard down below and we see kind of these little stories that are going on. There are a number of, of peripheral stories and we don't see television. Even though it's 1954, we're not going to see any televisions in the uh, in anybody's apartment, nobody's apartment uh, in this film, certainly not uh, our main character's apartment. No televisions or anything like that. So he's sort of just looking out across the courtyard and, you know, Channel 1 has a pretty girl in it, and Channel 2 has a, a musical composer in it, and Channel 3 has... Uh, another woman who goes on a series of dates, he names them all, Miss Torso and Miss Lonely Hearts, and so on and so forth. So they're all sort of peripheral stories that we see uh, to sort of uh, fill out our story. And uh, uh, in one apartment, there is a man and there is a woman, and we see her through the window in bed and often haranguing the man, I need this, I need that. We can't hear the words, but, you know, I need this and I need that and so on. And then the blinds are drawn, it's a rainy night, and the man across the way goes out at 2 a.m., something like that, with a large suitcase, and he comes back about 45 minutes later, and then the window is never open again, and we never see the sick woman in bed. Now, it could be a coincidence, or maybe she left to visit or something, uh, someone else, but our protagonist here, played by Jimmy Stewart, is pretty sure that a murder has taken place, and he's going to try and convince his therapist, who comes in to help him with his uh, recovery from his accident, and his, his girlfriend, and his editor, that there must have been a murder. Okay, so is he, is he paranoid, or obsessive, or is there really, has there really been a murder? And of course it wouldn't be much of a movie if there weren't, but uh, it was remade recently, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, with Shia LaBeouf as Disturbia. He has an ankle bracelet, I believe, uh, and he's been causing trouble in school, so he's a high school kid, and he is in his uh, upstairs bedroom, and he thinks he sees a murderer as well. So that's been redone as Disturbia. You can watch that for extra credit. Great stuff. I love that movie. And it, um, so, the big one. Psycho, based on a real-life event uh, that happened in Wisconsin back in the 1940s. A man named, named Ed Gein, G-E-I-N, if you're interested, uh, killed some people and skinned them and made things out of uh, their skins and things. And that is going to become the... the uh, Inspiration for not only Psycho, but Czech, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Silence of the Lambs and a few other movies, including one made about Ed Gein. So uh, it was fictionalized in a book called Psycho, and somebody showed it to Hitchcock. He thought, wouldn't it be nice for a good director like me, basically is what he's thinking, what a, a good director to take on this rather trashy, low-class subject matter? And, um, and Stanley Kubrick basically did the same thing with 2001 because sci-fi wasn't really very well thought of or very well regarded uh, when he decided to do 2001 in 1964. It took him three years. It came out in 68. But basically, Kubrick was thinking the same thing. And then um, a few years later, uh, The Exorcist was made uh, into a film. And again, a, a horror movie, a lot of sort of trashy horror-type movies and things, but not given... Uh, a big budget and uh, with a good director and, and good special effects and all that. So every once in a while a top-notch director uh, will take on the reins. And I suppose you could argue that maybe Christopher Nolan doing a superhero movie is doing the same thing um, with uh, with Batman. 
uh, the three Batman movies that Christopher Nolan made. But every once in a while, a really top-notch director will take on a genre film and, and do a pretty good job. So back to Hitchcock. Uh, he wouldn't show the script to the studio. He was sure that it has a big twist at the end. I'm certainly not going to tell you, even though the movie is is uh, uh, 60 years old. Um, uh, so no spoilers for me. And there's a there's a big reveal toward the end of the movie, and he knew that people would blab 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 all about it if uh, producers and studio people and secretaries and all those people got a hold of the script and accounting people and budget people and all that, producers and so on. So he wouldn't show anybody the script and so the studio got a little bit nervous about all that and they weren't going to put up a whole lot of money uh, for that. And so um, he uh, uh, mortgaged his house or took out a second mortgage on his house and put up the money himself. He made it in black and white. Partly it was saving money, but mainly because there would be a fair amount of blood uh, in the movie going down drains and whatnot. So Hitchcock made an awful lot of money from Psycho. It was one of the very top grossing movies, if not the top grossing movie in 1960. So Hitchcock did quite well for Psycho. And as, uh, as we see, uh, music... Uh, as a weapon, we're going to have a real shrieking violin during the horrific shower murder scene of poor Janet Lee. Uh, Hitchcock originally was just going to have stabbing sounds and screams, but no music. Uh, and the man, uh, uh, Bernard Herrmann, who was doing the music uh, for the movie, uh, dropped it in. Uh, wasn't told to do so by Hitchcock, but he dropped it in, and Hitchcock saw it and said, Oh, that's fantastic, that's fantastic. Uh, he was smart enough to know when somebody else came up with a better idea, but he wasn't planning on uh, on music. So we get music, shrieking violin type music. Now, the star, Janet Lee, you probably don't know her, but she was a star of the movie. Certainly it wasn't uh, Tony Perkins or anybody else, Martin Balsam, uh, or John Gavin, right? None of those, uh, uh, or Vera Miles. Uh, oh, I got all the names. I'm kind of surprised I named off everybody. Anyway, none of them were the stars of uh, Janet Lee's caliber, and she is going to get killed 43 minutes into the film, or thereabouts, in the shower. And that was pretty shocking. Not just getting stabbed in the shower, but being killed at the kind of the first third of the movie. That's pretty early in the movie. And so back then, a number of people would... Uh, go go to a movie maybe 15 or 20 or 30 minutes late, and it was the practice back then for theater owners to start the next movie maybe 15 minutes after the first one got out. So you know if you wanted to, you could just sort of sit, maybe go to the go to the uh, go to the restroom, maybe get some uh, some candy or something like that, and wait maybe 15 minutes, and the movie would start over again. And he didn't want people doing that <laughs> because. That, you know, because there was the ending and the, the shopping end, shocking ending and all that, the big reveal. So, and, and if they came in late, then they barely see the actress at all. And they'd probably be really frustrated. Oh, what a stupid movie. The star of the movie got killed, you know, in a few minutes. So he came up with this brilliant, he, I'm not sure it was him, but somebody came up with this brilliant plan. No entering the theater after the film started. Okay, so manager of this theater has been instructed at the risk of his life not to admit to the theater any persons after the picture starts. Any spurious attempts to enter by side doors, fire escapes, or ventilating shafts will be met by force. I like that, ventilating shafts. Okay, very nice. The entire objective of this extraordinary policy, of course, is to help you enjoy Psycho more. Signed, Alfred Hitchcock. And then right here, they would put when the next showing begins, and they would hire fake guards, armed guards. I don't think they had fake guns or whatever, but anyway, dressed, you know, like a guard, standing outside the theater, in the big theaters, like New York and L.A., not every theater, but in the big theaters. And uh, movies didn't play all across the country back then. Usually they would play in what they call limited release in a few theaters, and then 
from then it would play in a few more theaters a few more weeks later, New York, L.A., and then eventually mid-sized towns, and then finally small towns like where I grew up in Michigan, very small towns. It would take a series of months for the movie to get all the way out to small towns and everything. But in the big cities, uh, if it was playing at like the Chinese theater, there would be these, these fake guards out there uh, holding people back. So there would be long lines people heard, and they would get to the theater early, and they'd wait in line, and then people driving by on the street would see these long lines outside the theater. Oh, what's that? That's Hitchcock's new movie. Oh my gosh, maybe we better go see it, right? So, so it's pretty good, <laughs> pretty good uh, uh, marketing ploy. There were other odd marketing ploys uh, in the 1960s. There was a guy they called the poor man's Hitchcock. His name was William Castle. And uh, you might check him out. He's very funny. He had a movie called The Tingler, uh, which is this fear, like like it comes out of your spine or something. I can't remember exactly what, but it sort of it sort of crawls around. It looks like like a spine on legs or something like that, and it would crawl around. And uh, and in the movie, it gets loose and it goes into a projection booth in a theater, in the movie, right? So it's sort of a movie within the movie, and. And uh, uh, Castle, in a few of the big theaters, he had the theater. You can't believe they did this. You can't believe this. You won't believe this. They wired seats with electricity. And then when the tingler gets loose in the theater, they would jolt people in the audience. And they would jump and scream. They'd jump up and scream. I can't believe they did that, right? And I don't know how they tested the voltage or whatever. But anyway, they did that. It's well documented. They did that for the tingler and a few other movies. They, they, they Some movies... Uh, they had uh, a nurse, uh, and they had an ambulance parked outside of the theater, and you'd have to sign a release that you won't sue the theater if you suffered a heart attack or something like that. Uh, so there were lots of fun ways of promoting movies uh, back then. I don't know how many were William Castle and other ones like that, but you'd actually have to sign that. I won't, I won't sue the theater. <laughs> I, won't, I won't sue the theater if I get a heart attack. Uh, and they'd have nurses, uh, you know, I don't know, with with uh, stethoscopes and whatnot in there. Always, you know, actresses and so on. Uh, so anyway, I don't know, maybe Hitchcock started all that stuff, but uh, the wonderful guard and so on out front. So uh, the famous shower scene has, depending on where you start counting, a hundred or so edits or cuts, right? That's what they're called, it cuts. It took about a week to film just that shower sequence. And Hitchcock has not just violence, but there's a fair amount of sex. Uh, there's Janet Lee. She is seen three or four times in the movie in her uh, her underwear or lingerie, right? She's she's a uh, you know pretty blonde uh, young lady, and Hitchcock knew you know that um, uh, men in particular would you know like to see something like that. Taking a shower it sounds kind of lurid, really. Um, and she's seen a number of times uh, like that. And the opening scene, the camera goes across the skyline and goes into the window of this motel or hotel. And inside we see, this is the scene right here, uh, John Gavin uh, and, and she and, uh, and Janet Lee. And it's clear what's been going on, right? It's not just that they're hot, okay, been in bed. And, uh, and it's just sort of talking a little bit about checking out and so on. And so Hitchcock, he, he knew, right? He knew that sex and violence sell, right? It's not just violence, but he keeps throwing sex scenes in here. And we see her in her, in her bra and, and slip on a couple of occasions. In one, in one or two occasions, it's not white. And to a 1960s audience, that would seem kind of naughty. Maybe that's the sort of thing that those, those French women would do. But who, why would you need a lacy, colored bra, right? If who's going to see it would be the thought, right? That would be the thought. Who's going to see it? What kind of a, what kind of a, of a woman would wear pretty underwear would be the thought in 1960. Uh, so, yeah, Hitchcock sort of pushed. In, in the movie, it's dark. We don't know if it's, if it's blue or red or, or black. But anyway, she's wearing something dark in another scene. Uh, in, in her bra and slip. Um, and so she's the first person to die. And again, you know, the movie was based on a book. 
by a man, written by a man, directed by a man. And so there's a little bit of that sort of uh, puritanical, like the bad girl is the first one to die, okay, as seen from the male viewpoint, right? As seen from the male viewpoint, the bad girl's going to have to die, the girl that uh, puts out, okay? And when we get Friday the 13th type movies, Nightmare on Elm Street, and all those other kinds of movies, a lot of times it's the pretty cheerleader girl uh, that's the first victim, okay? And and I, I think, in large part, that's because men are the ones that are making these movies. You can think about that on your own, but um, uh, going back to Psycho, 1960, uh, there's Janet Lee, and she feels guilty. He doesn't. He doesn't. The guy doesn't feel guilty at all. It's kind of the double standard. He's like, well, when are we going to do this again? And she is, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to have a nice dinner at my sister's house. Okay? I don't want to be sneaking around anymore. She feels guilty. And, and she's going to die. She's the first one to die, right, for, for her sins. Okay? And I think, uh, again, we can discuss, um, because men are the ones that are making these movies. So, bad girl, premarital sex, and dies. Okay. And, and uh, a couple of guys are going to, at least one guy is going to die, too. So, um, but the very first victim is, uh, is Janet Lee, and she's the one, she's the one that's going to get it. Uh, so, uh, a lot of great Hitchcock stuff out there. Uh, check the links, the YouTube links. The, the entire uh, shower scene is, is there, the whole link for that. And there's a wonderful, creepy conversation between uh, her and Norman Bates, uh, the, the young man that is running the hotel, his mother's hotel. Um, and they have this wonderfully creepy conversation. If you watch the movie, go back and, and watch that scene in the, ho in the motel room uh, because there are uh, lots of sort of clues and reveals and things like that that make a lot of sense after you've already seen the movie, including such real creepy lines of dialogue like, a boy's best friend is his mother, Norman actually says. Um, and, uh, oh, he's got some other real creepy lines of dialogue. I'm trying to remember uh, uh, some of the good ones. Um, but uh, a lot is uh, foreshadowed in that 10 minute, five, 10 minute scene at the, at the beginning when she first arrives at the motel. Uh, so if you watch the movie to the end, go back, watch that scene again, and you'll see lots of, uh, lots of foreshadowing and, uh, and reveals and things like that. Uh, and Tony Perkins does a fantastic job as Norman Bates. And um, yeah, I mean, they've written whole books about Psycho, so uh, uh, we're not gonna get that deep, but it's a wonderful movie. And so um, that is the end of our uh, lecture for today. So now, if you haven't already, go to those links and start checking out uh, some of those scenes from The Shining and, and, um, and Psycho and Rear Window and all that good kind of stuff. Okay, we'll talk to you next time.